Good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you for your patience. Um, I'm Andrew Seeley, Executive Vice President of the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm here to greet you on behalf of Jane Harmon, our President and CEO, um, who wishes she could be here today to welcome His Excellency Babatunde Bashola. Um, Minister, well, I'll introduce in just a second. Um, Jane Harmon is actually up in New York. We have a series of events going on um, with Concordia that are going on at the same time as the UN General Assembly. And so we actually have an event um, going on either yesterday or today with a series of events, but one is actually with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Joyce Banda. Um, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and former President Joyce Banda, who is a uh, distinguished scholar here at the Wilson Center and the Center for Global Development. Um, so we are, have split duties here. But I have the great fortune of being able to then introduce uh, His Excellency uh, Fashola, who is a minister not of one but of, of three portfolios of power, works, and housing with the government of Nigeria, and he is the former governor of Lagos State. And I should say, if I may editorialize, we have been looking forward for some time to having Minister Fashola here since he was governor. Um, his uh, reputation, I think, precedes him as someone who has innovated and, and really looked at ways of, of uh, both public service and, and how you use public authority to improve people's lives and is now doing so in a very important way on the national stage. So it's a great honor to have you here with us today and, and the wait was worth it, I know. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, before we get started, let me take a moment to welcome our friends in the African Diplomatic Corps, members of the <laughs> Africa Program Advisory Council, the Nigerian and larger African diaspora community and other distinguished guests. Welcome to all of you. Um, the Wilson Center follows events on the ground in Africa very closely and strives to address key issues impacting Africa and U.S.-Africa relations. It seeks to be the leading institution for in-depth research and dialogue by bringing the voices and perspectives of African scholars, practitioners, and leaders, both public and private, to bear on these issues. In this vein, we are very excited today to hear directly from an African practitioner, one who has been widely recognized for his remarkable transformative reforms as governor of Lagos State in Nigeria. This event is especially significant to the Wilson Center as it marks the launch of the Africa Program's project on inclusive governance and leadership in Africa, which will highlight key leadership and governance challenges, distill lessons learned from innovations across the national, state, and local levels, and provide options for strengthening the institutions, systems, and processes that underpin effective governance. And this is something that Dr. Monde Muyangwa, who you'll hear from in a moment, has written about extensively and worked on for many years. Um, it's also something, obviously, Minister Fashola is known for, and, and we're very honored to have him as part of this launch. Um, the role in place of good governance and leadership cannot be underestimated in any country, including those in Africa. The challenges facing many young countries make good governance and leadership that much more important. Fairly or not, Africa has not always been viewed as the model for effective and inclusive people-centered governance, and often overshadowed by these issues are the leaders making a positive difference at various levels of society, striving to deliver services and provide the effective governance that their citizens demand. A more nuanced look at leadership and governance is critical to Africa's future, and the Wilson Center's Africa program endeavors to do just that, provide the platform to assess achievements and ongoing challenges, and to offer pragmatic solutions for African and U.S. practitioners and policymakers. As a leader renowned for spearheading reform in the mega city of the state of Lagos, it is fitting that His Excellency Babatunde Fashola speak at the launch of the Africa Program's Project on Inclusive Governance and Leadership. The governor of Lagos State from 2007 to 2015, His Excellency Fashola is widely recognized too for improving service delivery and enhancing government responsiveness and transparency. A key minister in President Bukhari's cabinet, His Excellency Fashola is now responsible for the combined ministerial portfolios of power, works, and housing. Any one of those three would be a significant portfolio in Nigeria. He has all three. <laughs> um, Your Excellency, we're honored to have you with us today. And it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over uh, to Dr. Monde Muyangwa, director of the Wilson Center's Africa program. Monde. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, boss. Uh, appreciate <laughs> you getting us off to uh, the good start. I wish to join Dr. Sally in welcoming all of you to the Wilson Center, and I especially, especially want to thank Minister Fashola <coughs> for finding the time to join us here. I first heard him speak, uh, it's probably about three years ago, at um, the colloquium up in uh, Brown University for Professor Chinua Achebe, and I was struck uh, by his comportment, the way he answered some really tough questions about why he was there. I think at the time he was under heavy criticism for having attended that event. And he struck me as extremely thoughtful. And when I came to the Wilson Center and we thought through what the Africa program should be about, at the core of the issues that we need to address on the African continent are issues of leadership and governance. 
And honestly, I could not think of a better person to help us launch this program on governance and leadership in an African context than the minister himself. So I spent the last two years basically stalking him. <laughs> and I am absolutely delighted that uh, he is here uh, with us today. As Andrew mentioned, this is a formal launch of the Africa's program's work on inclusive governance and leadership. And that the minister is here is critically important. But I want to step back for a moment and just set the context as to why this issue of leadership and governance in Africa is so important, which would then serve as a backdrop to the minister's remarks. We here, and as many African citizens also, believe that leadership and good governance are the foundations for peace, security, and sustainable development on the continent. And while some African countries have made significant progress in this regard, including on the democratic governance front, we still have many, many challenges ahead of the continent. To put it bluntly, the narrative on leadership and governance in Africa has largely focused on presidential leadership. And presidential leadership does matter, and it can make the biggest difference for a country. But it isn't the only level of leadership that matters. The fact that presidential leadership or the narrative on presidential leadership in Africa has often been couched in negative terms and defined by the struggles and inabilities of leaders to deliver basic needs and services for the vast majority of the citizen, defined often by some presidents who have adopted multi-party elections but not qualitative democracy or good governance practices, defined largely by a disconnect between leaders and their people in a way that brings into question the very connection between leadership and public service, and in some cases defined by leaders who defy term limits in order to hang on to power forever. Then there are also those who see not just individual, but also generational differences in approaches to leadership and governance. <coughs> These are all legitimate issues and questions. And as people who work on African issues, as people who are African, we should not shy away from these uh, issues. Yet, it is also important to note that often lost in this negative narrative on leadership and governance are African leaders at a mul multiplicity of levels who understand leadership as public service, who have worked effectively to deliver basic needs and services to ordinary citizens, and who have worked to transform their communities, states, and countries for the better. We do the continent and the issue a huge disservice when we fail to acknowledge this experience or to take a more comprehensive yet nuanced and layered understanding of leadership and governance questions in Africa. So for us here at the Wilson Center, the questions that we want to ask are, what lessons, good and bad, can we draw from these leaders in terms of understanding leadership in an African context? Where in many cases the nation state is fairly young, and the nature and scope of the state itself can be contested. On the continent where development challenges are such that service, service delivery is daunting. On a continent where African citizens have struggled to hold leaders accountable. And how can we best customize and amplify in the good lessons and practices while steering away from the negative practices? <coughs> One of the things that struck me about the minister is that he was not shy about talking about both the challenges and the positive aspects of what he felt he had accomplished. And that level of introspection, personally, is something that I have found wanting when you're talking to some political leaders on the African continent. And so what I hope the minister is going to do in helping us uh, think through these issues, as he offers his remarks here today, uh, we've asked him to talk about his experience as a governor of Lagos, and now in his current position, as super minister of those three portfolios that we talked about, to reflect on the core lessons, good and bad, that we can take from this experience, to reflect on how he sees leadership broadly across uh, the continent and what it is that leadership should be about uh, on the African continent. The minister really um, doesn't require an introduction, so I won't take away from his time by introducing him because Andrew has already done that, and many of you are familiar with what he attempted to do in, uh, with Lagos and what he actually achieved uh, in Lagos. And so with that, I will turn the microphone over to the minister. He will speak to us for about 30 minutes, 
and then we will engage in a Q&A uh, with uh, the minister. Minister Fashola, thank you so much for coming, and the microphone is yours, sir. <laughs> Wherever you're comfortable. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I, I, I think that uh, Dr. Selly and Dr. Muyango have been extremely generous in their, in their compliments and uh, <coughs> deeply humbled. And uh, let me start first by acknowledging the commitment and the very persevering disposition of uh, <laughs> Dr. Muyangwa, <coughs> working with uh, Professor Morogbe, who was my lecturer in the university, to finally bring me here. And as she said, it's taken the better part of two years. She's been so understanding. We've moved the event at my will, and because of my partly unforgiving schedule, but she never complained, and she's agreed to every suggestion but after moving it back and forth, I am here and I hope that it would all be worth our while. Um, I've put together uh, some, some notes here, which I will probably share when I'm done for those who perhaps are interested in further exploring the pits and falls of my thoughts. But I think that leadership could not be discussed by a speech. Uh, if I attempted to give one, it would take a whole day and we wouldn't be done. So I would rather, therefore, confine myself to the remarks, perhaps just to highlight some of the things I think we, we should talk about. And, and I leave you to the audience who watch us, really, to direct the discussions, and maybe then I can, I, I can offer uh, what limited experience and, and, uh, 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 I, I have. But I, I again have to thank Dr. Muyangwa because she, before my arrival, issued a press statement which she titled A Conversation with Baba Tunde Fashola. She gracefully shared it with me. And so, I think she has provided what I call useful props around which to discuss the subject of leadership and politics of reform in Africa and the lessons from Nigeria. Importantly, she's, she, she highlighted some of what she has alluded to just a few minutes ago, the focus on the presidency whereas there were capable leaders across all levels of society. She also identified, talked about identifying what the biggest challenges facing Africa on the leadership and governance fronts were. And of course, she raised the question about how leaders can engage or, or balance vested interests to tip the skills in favor of the kind of positive change that benefits the vast majority of ordinary people. And she also mentioned how change can be institutionalized so that governance reforms persist beyond one leader's tenure. Uh, I, I think there are very useful props around which uh, I, I will speak. And, and so I think, first of all, that uh, the question of leadership must be set in a context, understanding that nations and communities are different, they are diverse in their history and in the level of their evolution and their, their progress. And therefore, uh, if we looked to perhaps some of the most underdeveloped places, and the most developed places, security will still be an issue, but it will be of different complexities. Healthcare remains a global issue, even in the most advanced economies. So does education. It's an ongoing. And so I start from the point of looking in the mirror and looking at ourselves. 
Because we are the heart of these issues, people, the human civilization. And if we look at reforms as in his very simplistic word, to alter or to change something. Uh, perhaps we are the paradox. We live in a life that is changing every day, yet we are creatures of habit. Somehow we pursue change so relentlessly from our very earliest ancestors. And somehow there seems to be a habitual nature about us. And then we resist the change. And I've used the example of us. So let's imagine in our homes there's probably a favorite chair where you watch TV. Your soap, your sports program, or in the classroom, your corner in the classroom, and your regular desk mate, or indeed your office cluttered with paper, but you know where everything is. So let's apply reform. The janitor comes and cleans your office, tidies it up, improvement. <laughs> and then your spouse moves that favorite corner, which was not the best angle perhaps for your neck. Or somebody changes your sitting position in the classroom. How would you feel when you come in? Angry? Irritated? Dissatisfied? But that's what, that's the burden that our leaders face, altering our lives. Oftentimes, that's why we voted them. Alluding to the question of keeping reforms, we decide that in any event, leaders must go after four or eight years, no matter how well they have done. So we say it's time to go, time limits, which is very good. But yet we want some of the things they kept, they did, to remain when a new leader comes. And I ask the question, again, looking in the mirror, how many of us will keep an apartment in the same way that the last occupant occupied it when we move in. And I think it is in that context that we must really then understand my, my, my view that the challenge that leaders face requires them to be extremely knowledgeable because Implementing reforms requires interfering with the existing order. And no matter how bad the existing order is, somebody has a vested interest in it. So a bad road, there's a vested interest. It might require that somebody's property yield. That person has a vested interest in his or her property. So you will face resistance. And because we are creatures of habit, we hold on to the vested interest because that is what we know. The leader's responsibility is to transpose us, as it were, to see what he is seeing, <coughs> which is often very difficult. And that is the heart of communication. What is enough communication? I have not heard any leader in recent times, and perhaps in a long time, and perhaps never, ever accused of over-communicating. 
All we hear is we don't know what they are doing. They are not telling us, even if they are on TV every day. So what is enough communication? Should the leader reach everybody? Even if he did, be mindful that not everybody voted for him. So this for me are the issues. In my notes, I have talked about the test case. I've used our tariff reviews earlier this year as one of the difficult issues of reform. Tariff reviews to bring electricity pricing to commercial uh, competitiveness. The first response was a resistance that the discos and the operators didn't tell them what was happening. But all the law required them to do was to issue adverts, and there was evidence that they did. The law entitled them to recover their investments and some profit, which was what they were seeking to do. There was hardly any serious dispute that they needed to recover. The question was how many people had been told. I met documents, records, proceedings, of hearings, consultative meetings that took place in the various business units of the 11 distribution companies. But nevertheless, representatives of those who protested the loudest were the first to say, no, they were not consulted. But the law did not say who you should consult. It just said stakeholders. What was the reaction? Oh, there was a 45% increase. But that was not true, at least not accurately. Because there were different classes of subscribers. The most vulnerable subscribers under the classification R1 did not have their tariffs changed. So therefore, it is not true to say that there was a 45% increase. The tariffs differed from disco to disco, the distribution companies, we call them discos. The tariff rates differed from disco to disco. And so the changes were not uniform. And therefore, it was impossible to increase uniformly by 45% what was different across board. Now, the resistance to the review also overlooked the fact that there was a capacity charge that was in the old tariff order that consumers didn't like. This new tariff order had removed it. But it's a test case for what is enough communication or what is insufficient communication. Now, I've spoken about knowledge as a requisite for leadership, and I also would argue that consensus building is a very strong requirement. And of course, allied to that is communication. Now, on the African continent, how do you communicate? And for those who speak of Africa, who are not Africans, I, I like to make this point very quickly. Africa is not a state. It's over one billion people previously kingdoms, empires in their own rights, many nationalities within them, speaking different languages, holding different religious beliefs. <coughs> and so in Nigeria, for example, the language of business is English. And there are about three, four major languages widely spoken, and pidgin, the corruption of English and the local language. So if I were to enunciate policy, after I have done this to this audience, I haven't communicated until I transcribe everything I have said into Hausa, into Fufude, into Yoruba, into Igbo. And then perhaps in order to catch everybody put some of it in pigeon. 
But there are some people who still don't speak those four languages. So, those are the challenges that I believe some, if not all, uh, leaders face. And whether you are in Africa or you are in Asia or you are in Europe, the increasing platforms for communication have become so multiplied. And the attention span for receiving information there's a body of science that suggests that you must hear something up to seven times. Now, on what platform are you getting in? On your email, on Twitter, on Snapchat, or Instagram, or on your text? So th these are the dilemmas that, that beset uh, leaders now. But I, I think that we must look to ourselves more closely we must ask ourselves how fair it is to ask others to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And the kind of support that we in turn give back. Still dealing with consensus building and communication, I spoke about mindfulness. And I think it's a very, very important concept, being mindful, understanding that you are responsible for people's lives, understanding that what you do or fail to do determines whether or not their aspirations will be met or will be dashed, understanding that whether they lose their lives, their properties, depends on how you react or fail to react. And understanding that within the concept of leadership, there are perhaps two extremes. The status of the office and the responsibility of the office. And if you focus more on the responsibility of, of the office, you are beginning, perhaps in my view, to be more mindful. Of course, if you focus on the status, you are almost inevitably likely to lose your job. Now, within mindfulness, perhaps is the issue of the ego. We all have egos, every one of us, big and small, brittle and tough. Now, building consensus requires you to understand that the ego is yours. You don't belong to the ego, you own it. And so if your ego controls you, you won't build consensus because it will require you constantly to compromise. Because you are mindful that your compromise is not in your interest, it is in the interest of the people for whom you are responsible. And it becomes the more so in a democratic setting where the head of the executive has to work with parliament, a parliament that is as diverse. In Nigeria, at the federal level, you have 108 senators, 360 congressmen from across. How do you build consensus? So I think leaders must also be masters of their own ego so that they can see through the reason why they hold office, that it is not about them, it is about people. And perhaps this is where the concept of servant leadership comes in. Because, and that is why a 70-year-old man, an 80-year-old man will serve you as a cafeteria even though he's old enough to be your grandfather. He's managed his ego, he's doing a job. Is there to serve, is there to clean your face, is there to clean your shoes. And the same kind of uh, mindfulness, compromise, determination to deliver the chore is what is needed uh, at, the, at the larger level. I, I, I concluded by, of course, uh, 
providing a summary about what is happening in Nigeria vis-a-vis -vis our economy and what I am doing uh, in my ministry to, uh, to contribute my own part. Uh, my, my position is that uh, we're in a recession because of what we did yesterday. And I've drawn the allegory of the patient because there's a suggestion out there that you shouldn't talk about yesterday. That now that you're in government, yesterday is unimportant. I disagree. Yesterday remains very important because it helps us to understand today and to project tomorrow. And um, yesterday will also remain important when the time comes because it will be a referendum of what we have done compared to what happened yesterday. So for those who do not want to hear about yesterday, I'm sorry, I can't help them. We have to talk about yesterday. And the allegory of the patient that I used is that if a patient turns up at a physician's uh, clinic and says, I have a running stomach, my stomach hurts, the first question you're likely to hear is, what did you eat yesterday? <laughs> and that is the diagnosis that helps the doctor say, OK, your stomach pain is your recession. That's a symptom. What you ate yesterday. And so we're going to change your dietary habits. Don't eat what you ate yesterday because you are lactose intolerant or and so on and so forth. And then going forward, you know what to do not to have the same condition again. And I think that uh, as tough as it is uh, globally and uh, Nigeria not excluded, um, there's an immense opportunity here because I think the problems that I have seen since I assumed office are not technical, they're man-made. And so long as they're made by men and women, it's going to be dealt with, it's going to require men and women who sign up to serve, who are determined, uh, who refuse to be defeated like our president uh, and his team to solve the problem. So I'm hopeful and uh, I think that Nigeria's best days are ahead of her and this is an opportunity really to rebuild the fundamentals of our economy, our governance and, and so much more. So I won't take any more time. I think that the specifics of the issues that agitate you, uh, I hope I will be able to respond to. I thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Fashola. I think a very thoughtful presentation on the qualities of leadership and how you um, then translate that for um, the benefit of the people. Here's what I'm going to do. Normally I would sit here and ask our speaker some questions, but I see a full house, so I'll forego my time. Uh, but what I would like to do is just very quickly talk about the rules of engagement, and I need you all to work with me. I can be a pretty tough person if you don't work with me. So if you look around you, the room is full. So what I'm going to do is I will take three questions at a time. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand. We'll acknowledge you. Somebody will bring a microphone to you. You have one minute to either ask a question or make a comment. We'll take three questions at a time. When you get the mic, please identify yourself by name, your institutional affiliation, if any, and then uh, direct your question or comment to the minister. However, before I reach out to the audience, we have um, a number of questions that have followed you all the way from Nigeria uh, that came via email. So this is a question from Lagos, Nigeria. Monde, please ask the minister this question. He is reputed to have governed Lagos well. But is it not that Lagos is easier to govern more than any other part of Nigeria? <laughs> there is more revenue 
Up to 70% of Lagos revenue is generated within the state. No other states have up to 30%. Secondly, Lagos is cosmopolitan. No village or rural communities. The citizenry, the citizenry is largely educated. So from my perspective, I think the city is easier to govern. That is why governors in the state tend to outperform others. From the minister's perspective, is this true? And if not, why has he been unable to repeat the same performance in Abuja? <laughs> so, Minister Fashola, that's a tough one to begin with, but I'll take two more and then we'll turn it over to you, sir. So, I acknowledge my brother in the blue shirt over there. Okay, good. P please. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Tolu Balade. I'm actually from Lagos State, so yeah. Shout out to Fashola. All right, moving on. Um, I have a very important question. Um, basically, we're talking that we've talked about infrastructure a lot, and then now you're the Minister of Power and Works. So we've talked about infrastructure a lot, in the sense of how infrastructure can basically lead to like a positive cascading effect in basically boosting GDP. So infrastructure in the sense of two things that I'm going to ask you about. How exactly do you feel as the Minister of Works you're going to help? let's say just a legal state in the sense of electricity because we know it's not constant at this point in time and then we've talked about the privatization of PHC and, and how that's going to lead to basically generation of more electricity but that hasn't happened and two basically the development of roads um, basically I'm from Lekki so like I know about the, the Lekki Koyi bridge and the roads that have been constructed around there but basically those have been private those have actually been done by private companies no public companies, so what exactly is the government in itself doing, not private companies? Yeah. Okay. We'll take one more question <coughs> from the gentleman up front. Uh, Could you wait for the mic? Thank you. Thank you. Kes Gebre, Boi State University and Independent uh, Council. Um, uh, Minister, thanks for coming and thanks to the Wilson Center for your uh, courage in trying to look for leadership in Africa. Um, Minister, isn't it the case, you know, given um, what you said about, um, you know, getting people uh, consensus and uh, stakeholders involved, what can you tell us about what you're doing as Minister of Power uh, to get stakeholders in uh, generator business and all kinds of things there in, in moving the project of uh, getting power to people, whether you're doing so by the traditional grid or uh, uh, solar power, whatever that is. That's one. Number two. Uh uh, my brother. <laughs> is it done? I thought this well, is. I just one question. Minutes. No, no, one question. Okay, I'll concede. Thank oh. you, sir. I appreciate it. <laughs> I, l I appreciate you working with me on this one. Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'll take them in the order that they have come. Uh, the question by email made some uh, inaccurate assumptions. Uh, one of the inaccurate assumptions is that um, um, there are no rural areas in Lagos. That's not correct. There are many uh, in Ikurudu, in um, Ekpe, in Badagri, some parts of uh, Ijeshate do itire are still largely rural and um, or semi-urban. But that 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 aside, again, the revenues in Lagos are not guaranteed. Lagos, from the time of my predecessor, took a very clear uh, pathway to become less dependent on uh, <coughs> federal resources. Um, and at the time, in 1999, Lagos was earning 600 million naira monthly. Um, that did not mean that that was all that was being generated in Lagos. Nobody was just collecting the taxes. And when the tax collection started, by the time I became governor, Lagos was collecting 7 billion naira monthly from 600 million. And there were, I think, about half a million 
people in a state of then in 2007, about 17, 18 million people. In that state, only about half a million people were on the books paying tax. But by continuing with and improving on the tax administration policy, creating an office of taxation and revenue um, at cabinet level, empowering the, the tax collectors, moving them away from the regular civil service. Uh, the head of the tax team, the, the head of the tax administration, earned more than I did, because I thought that if we were going to ask you to go and collect money, we must also make you comfortable enough to resist compromising us. Mm -hmm. Of course, the attrition levels were higher. But by the time I left, we were doing 23 billion naira every month from seven. And we now had about 4.5 million people in the tax net. And there's still scope for improvement. <laughs> now, why is this important? The revenues were coming from income tax because we had a large population. It was also coming from taxes on services. We had developed a night economy that wasn't there by investing in security, in street lighting. So the economy was now working 24 hours, so more people were employed and, and so on. So, and it is also not the case that there is any part of Nigeria that cannot develop the same capacity. And states like Ugu, Edo, Kwara, Litli, and, and many others are beginning to see their revenues inch up. So there's, no, there's and there's nothing guaranteed in it because uh, the people who pay the taxes will migrate to another part of the country if they see services diminish. So there's no guarantee in that revenue. And when you contradistinct this with, and the tax revenues were known because we accounted for them, but they didn't come as 23 billion. They came daily. Somebody pays property tax. Somebody registers a vehicle. Somebody pays uh, uh, consumption tax. But we made it a duty to disclose every month how much we had collected. And that was different from states that were deriving oil revenues and who didn't have the size of our population. There were a few states that were earning over 30 billion naira and had a quarter of our population. So there's nothing really uh, cast in stone here. And there's, I, I don't think there's any state in Nigeria that does not have the capacity to generate revenues if we try hard enough. And the opportunities that I see in these challenging times is already manifesting themselves with how the governors are beginning to look uh, at other sorts of... Uh, but I won't belabor that matter any further. I think that... Uh, let's see. Um, the second question is about electricity to Lagos. Again, uh, my responsibility goes beyond Lagos. I've finished my tour of duty as governor. Um, so that's behind. But it's about the country now. Let me say that one of the problems, let me acknowledge first, let me acknowledge first that I was a champion for privatization of electricity because um, utilities have a commercial value and if they are run by uh, the efficiencies and uh, waste minimizing uh, ethos that we see in private sector, they stand a chance of, of being uh, efficiently managed. So, but our privatization experience was not without difficulties, but that's in the past. Uh, we must move on from there. One of the big problems was the communication of what privatization meant. And for some people at the time, the unmanaged expectation was that once the exercise finished, there was going to be electricity. Now, I think that, uh, and I've had this discussion 
in a session earlier that I think we're being a little hard on ourselves. I understand that it comes with the expectation. But if we haven't delivered stable and reliable electricity since 1950, which is 63 years, until 2013, is it really fair and is it reasonable to expect that all of what we couldn't do in 63 years will be done in three years? Because the privatization took place in November 2013. Yes, it is nice to be aspirational, and I don't by this suggest that we should take another 10 years. I don't even suggest. But I think we must be clear and methodical in how we approach this. And that is why we've laid out a very simple roadmap uh, talking about what are the first steps. <coughs> the first steps require us to identify what the problem is. Given our numbers, we don't have enough power. So. The simple thing to do first is, if you want something you don't have enough of, get more of it. So the first leg in our roadmap is incremental power. Do more hydro, do more coal, do more solar, do more renewables, do more gas. So everywhere you can get one kilowatt of energy, add it on. The next step is steady power. And then the final step will be uninterrupted power. And that will require all of us then to understand first that power has to be paid for, that we have to conserve energy, that what we waste will never be enough, and so on and so forth. So I think that the privatization, in spite of its challenges, can work. And I think three years is, is too early. It's still under three years. It'll be three years in November. And uh, the incremental power that we have now, in spite of what we have lost to uh, sabotage and vandalization. Uh, and and let, me, let me contextualize that. Up to last two weeks, we were generating 4,000 megawatts without the gas. And we've lost about 3,000 megawatts of gas through vandalism. Now, how was that possible? We've increased the capacity of the hydros by fixing turbines that had been abandoned or unmaintained for about three decades. In the last one year, a lot of maintenance work, repair work, so that every year, of course, there's an increased cycle of rainfall and water levels. But if you have three turbines and only one is working, no matter how much rainfall you have, you can only put on one. Now, so where we had one working, we now have two. Where we had two before, we now have three. So the hydros are giving us almost 400 megawatt extra, and that's a lot of power, given our situation. And we've added about uh, one megawatt of, of, of solar, and there's more coming. And, and so I, I, I think we're, we're on our way. Um, about what is being done in terms of consensus building since I became uh, minister. One of the things I do uh, unfailingly every first Monday of the month, and I think that this is the first month that I missed it, incidentally, is to, since January, unfailingly we've met with all the distribution companies, representatives of the transmission company, all the generation companies, the gas providers, the uh, representative of the central bank, and we meet from one power facility to the other. First, it was important for me to see what I'm managing, and I couldn't go on a tour and leave my desk. And so that was the whole idea behind that power. Secondly, we asked each or a set or cluster of those power facilities, wherever they were in the country, to volunteer to host us. So in that way, we also wanted to do some peer review. Thirdly, it provided us an opportunity once in a month for everybody to be in one room. So we can hear all the problems and some can be solved on the spot instead of writing letters. And that has helped in no small way to get everybody together. So it's a meeting that everybody comes 
and it has solved some problems and we continue. The next one will be on the 10th in, in Sokoto. So we've gone to uh, Benin, we've gone to uh, Calabar, we've been to Jeba, we've been to Kaduna, we've been to uh, Lagos. Um, where were we in the last month? The last one was where? <laughs> anyway, it's moving. <laughs> yeah, we were in Maiduguri, in the northeast, where we saw all of the damage that had been done by the uh, 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 terrorists and the work because the contractor had to flee for two years. Now they're back on site and they're rebuilding and restoring power there. So, Thank you. We'll take another three. This time, would, do you mind if I go to the back there? I'll take um, the gentleman over there, the gentleman over here, and then the lady right there. And don't worry, we're going to get everybody in. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Governor Fashola. I'm uh, Tokumbo Ayeni. I'm the founder of Pan-Africa Children Advocacy Watch. It's a non-profit organization involved in education in sub-Saharan Africa. I just want to expand the discussion a little bit. Can you give us some sense of what it would take to get the nations of sub-Saharan Africa focused on the fundamentals of human development. Clean tap water, not boreholes. Okay? Electricity grid, not generators. Good basic education. Inclusive institutions. Good healthcare system. And above all, leadership that does not cater to the opulence of the few, but is concerned about the good and the well-being of the many. All right, this is the gentleman right here. Yes. Uh, I'll come to you. It's all right. We'll come to you. Minister, it's a pleasure to see you. I've been told that uh, we look alike, so it's always a pleasure to see you. <laughs> uh, let me first for of all real? commend you uh, for what you did in Lagos, because, but for your leadership there, I don't think Mark Zuckerberg would have gone there uh, last month like he did. So that's a, a plaudit to you. Uh, however, while I was in Lagos recently, I saw that Apapa has serious gridlock. Now this is the major thoroughfare from the ports uh, for an import dependent country. <coughs> and so the landed cost of the goods is higher because of the gridlock. So my question to you is, why in this day and age do uh, business people have to take motorbikes in Lagos, in Apapa, when this is a very strategic, probably the most strategic route thoroughfare in the entire country in terms of the volume uh, that it, uh, it generates? And then uh, finally, I understand that with the gas emergency, that's that two questions. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Can you do that? I have a lot of people here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amaka Anku, and I run a, a small research, Africa-focused research and advisory firm based here in DC. Um, so my question is really about um, oil and the, the petroleum sector and, and the Niger Delta. So with all the focus on low oil prices, there's been a lot less attention on the renewed militancy and the significant impact it's having on production. Um, so, you know, as you know, there's been almost a 40% cut in production in some months. Last month it was 40%, some months it's been, it's been less. Um, and my question is, you know, speaking of leadership and vested interest, what would your advice be to, I mean, either the government or the federal government or local leaders or the international community on sort of how you engage militancy and sort of what you do to uh, stop or avert or, or reduce <coughs> the threat in the Niger Delta. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think, first of all, that um, we must understand that the actions of those people who damage public assets and national infrastructure violates the law. Let's first accept that 
And so no matter how angry you are, it is no excuse for taking up arms against your own country or indeed damaging what is the commonwealth. The fact that a road passes through my village does not vest ownership of that road in me or indeed in my village, especially if it is built with the commonwealth. At best, I am only a trustee of that asset for the benefit of the larger community. And if I have a grouse, the solution is not to go and dig up that road. So in that sense, therefore, I think law and order is the first regime for dealing with this. And I think that conflicts can be resolved within the framework of law and order. And I would advise uh, anybody who is aggrieved, whether here or in any part of the world, to engage the institutional platforms because they exist. There might be arguments about how efficient or inefficient they may be, but they exist for conflict resolution. Um, and that is why the President is not taking anything off the table. He understands the need to secure the place. And that is why the Chief of Army Staff and his team and other security agencies are there trying to restore law and order. And at the same time, there are channels of communications. Government is indicating that we're ready to talk if we know who to talk to, who to deal with. Uh, but I say that no set of people that I know have ever been angry forever. And therefore, at some time, all of this will, will go away. Um, in terms of a papa, I think it is fair to also say that a papa didn't happen today. A papa is the result of the choices that we made about three, four decades ago, maybe when I was 10 or 15. Because a papa has our first port. It was our first industrial estate built by the Europeans. And all of the assets for cargo evacuation from the port had with it a real facility that evacuated cargo from the port and the tank farms in Apapa. We chose to start evacuating the cargo by road and left the rail, as it were, to go into disuse. And slowly, the Nigerian Railway Corporation and all of its expertise and its, and its uh, capacity went into this field. And we started inflicting our roads with the tonnage of container cargo, fuel cargo, and all of that. But as if that wasn't bad enough, there's also a pumping facility for pumping fuel from Lagos towards the boundary of Ogun State. For some reason, over the years, we chose not to allow it to work. So that is why, for me, yesterday is always important. So that you remember what you ate yesterday. And what you must not eat again. As governor, I engaged the then federal government on APAPA on not a few occasions. And if there's any sense, indicative sense of order there, I, I awarded the contract for the building of 11 roads to restore the residential area and build on the, the, the no, sir, but what happened? The articulated trucks turned them into parking lots. 
All of this is documented, but in a cruel irony of fate, it is now my responsibility to deal with it. <laughs> but it's happening at a time when the resources have dwindled. We could have solved our papa at the time we were earning $100 per barrel of oil. And we are now earning less. But it's not my nature to bemoan my circumstance. I'm going to give it my best shot. Uh, the, the bridge that evacuates a papa has not been maintained for 40 years. And after severe tonnage abuse, it gave way. So the first thing that we've done in the last four or five weeks is to first restore stability and ensure that it doesn't collapse and become uh, a source of a loss of lives. Now we are asking constructing companies to give us a quote, so they're working from the blind because the construction company that built it has left Nigeria. So until we have clear engineering options to choose from, which is what I'm waiting for, and then um, let me also say that our infrastructure choices in spite of the limited funds are, are very clear, they're rational. If we want to make our economy work, we have to build roads that evacuate our ports. We have to build roads that evacuate our sea and airports, our roads that drive our energy for now, the, the uh, roads that go to the tank farms to take fuel from south to north, and roads that sustain us in terms of nourishment, and that is roads that bring cargo, our protein in terms of animal feedstock and vegetables, and livestock from north down to south. And those are the choices we have made. They're not esoteric choices. They're very simple and rational choices. All of the road contracts in any event have been awarded before I got there by the previous administration, over 206 roads. Now, you don't have the resources to finish 206 roads. Where do you put your resources, limited resources now? Is in those areas. And that is why you will see us building from the Lagos Ibadan Expressway through Ilori to Jeba to link you all the way to Kaduna and Kanu and, 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 and go up north. And we're doing the same thing across trying to connect the River Benue and uh, through the local Weto Bridge and the second Niger Bridge, uh, Kanu Kaduna, uh, uh, Kanu Maiduguri. Those are the choices we have made. And because this is a period of hard choices, trying to do more with less. Um, well, the fundamentals of human development, that is quite a, a bag of uh, 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 things you put in one place there. And as I said before, we could talk about that. It's about choices, really. There's no prescription for it. And uh, if you see, if you see what has happened in the United Arab Emirates, and this is not lost in history, the same oil resources that we earned in our lifetime was used to develop a desert that was once and until 1971 a British colony. So it's a matter of choices. And you know what? You may, you may like or not like this. Right? But what are Africans doing here? There's work to do back home. Oh, is it because we have a place to escape to? What if the people here didn't build this civilization? Where would we go? Half of my class left when I graduated. But some things in me just couldn't leave. The promise of that country keeps me there. And I hope that in my lifetime I will see it. So, please, I think there's work to do at home. And each one of us must be ready to come back.
If that is the place we call home, we can't discuss it from far. What are you doing there? It's the place we call home. Go back home. There's work to be done. Very powerful. Let me take another set of three questions. I really have to go to my brothers and sisters in the back over there also. I'll, I will swing around this way. Uh, I'm coming, so please bear with me. Let me take the three in the back over there, and then we'll swing down uh, this way. Good day, Minister. My name is uh, Babatunde Ogunsalu, and um, I started an organization called Think Africa. And uh, to your point, our organization, our main mission is to take youth and young professionals back to Nigeria. Uh, we have uh, planned a trip to take about 20 to 40 young professionals to Nigeria in December. And uh, this leads to my question. Um, what programs and what resources do you have for the youth who are actually trying to come back to Nigeria and tap into the promise and, uh, you know, see Nigeria prosper in our lifetime and, you know, be a part of that whole transition? Okay. Thank you. The gentleman right next to him. Hey, good afternoon, Minister. My name is actually Tunde as well, which is like the ninth Tunde has come to talk. But um, thank, thank you for, for coming. Um, I think it's very difficult today to have a discussion about governance in the region without ish issues of corruption being brought up at some point. And I was wondering what your thoughts thoughts were on that. If you thought that, um, if you think we maybe exaggerate the Im the Im the impact of corruption on on our on our gov governance issues, or if you think it is actually as dire as sort of the picture we paint, and if you think it actually exacerbates some of the developmental and governance problems that we face today in the country. All right, thank you. In the oh, Ali, hi. Hi, how are you? <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Ali Lyons, <laughs> uh, formerly with the Wilson Center's Africa program, um, and currently with Partners Global, which is an international uh, NGO that works on inclusive governance issues. And I'm with the Africa program there as well. And we have a partner center in Nigeria, so we work very closely on inclusive governance issues uh, in Nigeria. So first, I just want to thank you, Minister, for your very thoughtful comments uh, on leadership. Um, my program looks at the role of civil society in these inclusive processes, and I was wondering if you could elaborate or provide some insights as to what you think the role of civil society uh, in Nigeria should be in supporting uh, inclusive governance processes. Um, as we all know, uh, Nigeria's uh, civil society is very vibrant and very uh, actively engaged, so I, I think there uh, would probably be uh, a lot of uh, interest in hearing your thoughts on that. So youth, corruption, and civil society. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, uh, these, are, these are matters <coughs> that honestly I, I have reflected on deeply. Uh, and I think that uh, I lived in a Nigeria, I grew up in a Nigeria that perhaps was less complicated than it is now. And I saw its period of prosperity. And of course, like all economies, uh, uh, periodic challenges. But um, civil society clearly has played a role in, in, in Nigeria. And nobody can fairly discount the role they have played in. But again, uh, can we have an institution without uh, checks and balances? Who regulates them? And these were some of the issues that taken up at the World Bank uh, in the past. But that said, one of the deeper thoughts that have crossed my mind was what are the differential definitions of family units within the West and perhaps Africa? <coughs> because if I am not mistaken, the idea of civil society came from the West. But if you recognize that within the African concept of family is the community itself, perhaps we are layering on it what already exists. 
as distinct from the concept, the nuclear family concept that is much more prevalent in the West, which in my view uh, perhaps then makes the necessity for a community organization to provide for people who have left outside the fringes of the nuclear family as properly defined here. But it's a debate that uh, I have engaged privately, but it doesn't take away from the contribution that civil society has, has, has contributed. Perhaps whether more could have been done or less has been achieved is a question now of how the court, the, the potentiality for cultural clashes have, have perhaps been managed. Um, undoubtedly, in every society, uh, corruption, corruption has, has an impact. Uh, a very adverse one, if you ask me. And in my country, uh, if today uh, all my ministry can spend on roads in the first quarter is 73 billion, that is a fraction of what was taken out of our economy in the last decade. And while that was being taken out in the last few years, contractors for roads, contractors for power plants, who I met with when I assumed office told me they hadn't been paid for three years. So if you have a recession today, that's what we ate yesterday. We took the money out of the place where it could be more productive and it's finding itself as is being revealed now in private accounts. But corruption goes beyond the cash. Again, for me, it is a symptom of something much more uh, important. It's law and order. So instead of focusing on that, I, 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 I have argued always that it's law and order. There is no society that is free of corruption, none. And because the way it manifests itself is diverse and really uh, dynamic, and that is why no nation in the world that I know has disbanded its law enforcement or its judicial system or it's a corrective system. The reason they are there is to hold people to account. If you cross the line, there is a sanction. Uh, and so, but given what we have experienced, it's, on, it's very clear that uh, it would have an adverse impact, just like in any family, really. So we're just one big family. So if, if money that was meant to buy dinner is converted by my sibling, there will be consequences. We are going to be hungry. So uh, it's, it has uh, a negative impact. Well, in terms of uh, what resources for young people um, that are back home, I, I think that what were the assurances by those who left home of what they will meet here. What guarantees did you have? I perhaps understand those who were born here. <coughs> Nine out of ten, many of those who are now here came in search of an education. But I think the point to make is that I made this choice, uh, and uh, you, you can make your own choice. I'd rather be at home than be here. You know, all my education was in Nigeria, but I started visiting this country at age 13. So I have siblings who went to school abroad. I refused. My father wanted me to study abroad, and I said, no, if you have money, let me come for holiday.
So one of the places I first visited was New York, Central Park. I was 13. And then we came here to Arlington Cemetery, the uh, Washington Monument and all of that, the guided tours. I don't know if they still run them. And then we went to a city called Springfield in Illinois. But it was part of my education. Of course, I visited the Empire State Building. But you know, there's something back home that even as a 13-year-old, this just didn't do it for me. And it still doesn't do it for me. But I think, I think that there's too much of Africa's talent outside the continent. And it must begin to go back home. But nobody can force you. But it's the only place where you can fully, fully, nobody will ask you questions. You know, nobody will question whether you were born here or you were not born here. This is your identity. You can't fake this. So. I have a sense this discussion is going to continue on, 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 <laughs> <laughs> on the really important role of the diaspora. Let me do this. Okay, my sisters here are going to kill me because they have had their hands up for a very long time. You have 30 seconds, and then I'll give the minister two minutes, and then I'll wrap this thing up so we can uh, make sure that the minister gets out of here on, on time. So my sister, you have exactly 30 seconds. Work with me. As they say, on who wants to be a millionaire, your 30 seconds starts <laughs> now. <laughs> now. <laughs> Thank you very friend. much. Um, <laughs> Honorable Minister, you had said when you started speaking that um, we're people of habits, we're habitual, and that, in essence, change is inevitable. We know you're a change agent. We know that, indeed, you are one of the leaders in Nigeria and Africa leading reforms. How do you deal with criticisms and um, resistance to these reforms and changes? How do you deal with them? Okay. Oh. That's it. Yes, please. Okay. Criticisms, first of all, I, I've spoken about ego. I've spoken about uh, uh, mindfulness. I understand that my critics have categories into which they fall. Those who want to criticize simply because they don't agree. I'm ready to debate those. And luckily, my, my, my training is really a life of being on, on <laughs> opposing sides. So I'm, I'm happy to have them debate me about whether their ideas are superior or, or not. And I, I've, I've won not a few arguments. But the people also who criticize because I am wrong, and I'm able to introspect and ask myself, are you being deliberately stubborn because you don't want to accept that you are wrong? So I've reversed myself on, myself on occasion publicly because I accept that I don't have a monopoly of knowledge. I work with a team that can debate me, that disagree with me, and so I, I thrive in a, in a culture of debate. It's a place where I am very comfortable. So perhaps in that sense, as far as resistance is concerned, uh, one of the lessons I learned, which I've tried to share, I don't know how, how well I've done so, is that people don't resist change because they dislike it. They resist it because they have a vested interest in the established order. And so if you want them to change, you now have the difficulty and the responsibility to persuade me that this is the best place to talk to you instead of where I'm sitting down. Because I have become comfortable here. And, and that's the way that, that uh, I, I've tried to deal with, with resistance. And, and you will see 
uh, better models of that across leaders <coughs> who, whether as presidents or mayors, uh, have gotten things done because they're ready to engage. Well, thank you so much. And I'm really sorry to cut this off because uh, it's, it's a really, really rich um, discussion. I think the minister has done a fantastic job of raising some really key issues that I think we must think about if we're going to have a discussion about leadership and inclusive governance on the continent. Let me just quickly try and highlight some of what I thought I heard both from the minister and from you all here today. I really like that the minister started out not so much with what he had accomplished in uh, Lagos, although that is part of what we asked him to do, but really talking about the qualities of governance, of good leadership, of good governance. And what I have here is a little card that I wish next time I'm with African presidents and others, I will use it as my little benchmark to judge them against. I think you mentioned a number of qualities of leadership that I think are important. One was knowledge as being a requisite for leaders. I think too often, particularly at that very high presidential level that we talk about, we see people who want power for the sake of power and not necessarily that they actually have a clear sense of what it is that they're going to do once they get into power or that they even understand this larger issue of leadership and governance. So that, that knowledge uh, element of it, I, I think, is, is really important. The minister also talked about the leadership being able to articulate a vision and then get the people to buy into that vision, to communicate that vision. But I thought one of the really interesting things that he talked about for me was this leaders being able to communicate and really putting it in an, Af in an African context of the multiplicity of the diversity of the audience that one has to deal with, the diversity of the stakeholders that you have to deal with, whether it's in terms of language, whether it's in terms of their, 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 their vested uh, interest, and really understanding that and figuring out which are the best modalities for engaging and communicating with the different uh, diversities within the larger whole of communicating with the different vested interests and how that can be really challenging from a leadership uh, dimension. And I think sometimes we, we, we forget this. I mean, I come from a generation where my grandmother didn't speak English. She spoke uh, the local language. So uh, our generation, my mother's generation, was the first generation uh, to go into college and, and, and that sort of thing. But also within that now, you have intermarriage amongst the different ethnic groups, and that brings its own challenges of identity and communication. And so understanding that from that, that leadership uh, perspective. I thought the minister's point about mindfulness for me was really, really important. Uh, that this is uh, something that I think on the face of it, you, you really don't think about it. But as he boiled it down to the importance of mindfulness, and what I really liked was his talking about understanding both the status of office and the responsibilities of office. I think too often people are caught up in the status and the trappings of power, not so much on the responsibilities. And so how do you bring those two things uh, together so that you can deliver for the benefit of the people? I think these are some of the issues that we need um, uh, to focus on. The consensus building, I think he went... Um, a great length to uh, really talk about how you, you know, communicate and build that uh, consensus, managing your own ego as well as understanding the ego of others. <laughs> and how, for me, this is particularly important in an African context where institutions are not yet that strong, the institutions of governance. So understanding who you're dealing with and the position from which you're engaging with what matters to them as well as what matters to the people. I thought that is something that's very important that the, the, the minister uh, talked about. He raised a key point about remembering where you have come from, the importance of understanding where you've come from and the choices that you made. That those choices are not just for the here and now, but those choices are going to impact not just today, but future generations. And I think personally for me, my own background, one of the issues that I have felt that the continent has struggled with is really this long-term planning at that strategic level. 
It's not just a long-term strategic level planning that has been lacking, but it's also the management of the political cycles. You know, you're in office for four to five years, and yet the results that you seek are going to take 10, 15 years down the road. How do you manage that? And then how do you manage expectations? You have to manage expectations. And I think his, his point was really powerful about, you know, you look at the challenges that Nigeria faced. The, um, President Buhari has now been uh, in office since 2015. That's not nearly in enough time to really deliver on those expectations, really high expectations that people had. And it's not just Nigerians. I think all of us in the international community we were also cheering on Nigeria. You know, Boko Haram is going to be dealt with. The Chibok girls are coming home. We're going to have, you know, all of these issues, those expectations. But I do think that a failure of some African leaders has been this paternalistic attitude of engaging on those expectations. It's almost as if father says this is how it's going to happen and therefore you just sit back and wait for it to happen. But I think what the minister raised here today was absolutely critical that it is a two-way street. I think the citizen has to be uh, more in tune with how long it takes to deliver on these uh, things. But the leadership also has to communicate and begin to manage those expectations uh, better. The minister could have added a, 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 another point. What, what I felt come from him, especially when he was talking about the role of the diaspora, was the passion for the continent, the passion for doing right by the people of that continent. You have to feel it in here as a leader to want to do the right thing for your people. And unfortunately, that isn't always the case. But I think that passion is something that's important for all of us uh, to remember. I could uh, go on and on, uh, but those were some of the key points that I heard uh, from the minister. And I think from you all, I also heard back to the minister some issues that you want him uh, to, 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 to think about and to talk about. The issue of the role of the youth. Africa has a really youthful population. How do you better engage the youth in its own future? How do you create opportunities, create an environment that helps um, youth to, uh, to contribute, to realize their own expectations and aspirations? The issue of, of corruption. This comes up every time, unfortunately. I'm sorry to be the, every time you talk Nigeria, corruption is not too far behind. And so I think just dealing with that stereotype, your point is absolutely well taken that every country has to deal with corruption. But I think, unfortunately, Nigeria's case, because of its history, regardless of what Nigeria does, that issue always comes up, and pretty soon after you engage in that discussion. And I know President Buhari made this a core component of what he's going to tackle. So demonstrating to the public that you're continuing to push and push hard on those issues of addressing uh, corruption, I think, is key. <coughs> There was an issue of the Niger Delta that was, was raised here. I think the underlying sense of that, and I, and I liked your response, but I think there was an underlying sense of that that was the people in the Niger Delta do not, or the, the ones that are fighting this, the militancy, they don't feel a sense of belonging to this larger Nigeria that's being crafted, this larger nation that's being built. So even as you address the issues of law and order, how do you better give people in these communities that sense of belonging, sense of benefiting from this larger Nigeria enterprise that many of us are absolutely, absolutely cheering on, that you succeed. And we love your passion for it. We love the thing that you chose to stay. And it is a deliberate choice. And we're glad that you chose to stay. And with that, please join me in absolutely thanking the minister for a wonderful, wonderful uh, event here today. I also want to thank my colleagues at uh, the Wilson Center for helping put this on, and all of you for coming to this fantastic event. And the minister, I'll impose on you for two seconds. If you could please take a photo with the Africa program team, because they won't let me live it down if I let you escape without a photo with them. <laughs> Shall I take that? You're good? Thank you. That was fantastic.